So thank you. Uh, Apostle Daniel, my apologies. I was having some issues here, uh, but I'm able to get on. Thank you, Lord. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, tonight, uh, you know, I asked uh, Apostle Daniel what he wanted me to share, and he just said, go with the flow. And and then he said, um, if you want to share on righteousness uh, a little bit, uh, <clears throat> go ahead and go with that. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and go with that. <laughs> Um, I'm an avid believer in the kingdom, you know, apostle, I don't know how many of you know, apostle Cal, but we've been preaching the kingdom here at golden altar ministry for the past 15 years. And, uh, the kingdom, the message of the kingdom has really shifted my life. It has shifted my ministry, my understanding, my whole concept has changed to have a kingdom mindset is so important uh, and I don't, I, I'm, I, I'm going to talk about an aspect of righteousness uh, tonight to give us, I'm going to lay a foundation and just to give us a solid understanding uh, of, of righteousness, because you cannot, we cannot be kingdom preachers and talk about order and talk about uh, alignment and ascension gifts and all these different things outside of something called righteousness. righteousness. You know, about seven years ago, the Lord challenged me regarding righteousness because I preach the kingdom. I can preach the kingdom and release it. But he said, this is what he said to me, Apostle Daniel and those here. He said, Andrew, you don't you don't understand righteousness like you understand the kingdom. And I said, sure, I do. <laughs> and then he took me on a journey and I began to understand how the body of Christ lacks this simple truth that I'm not even going to say simple truth because there's depth to the under the revelational understanding of righteousness. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> do the best I can to lay a foundation and to bring forth some, some under some key understanding uh, and principles and keys regarding righteousness. And as he began to challenge me uh, and, uh, Apostle Daniel, you said about 35, 40 minutes. If you could just give me like a five minute warning, that way I can kind of know, but I'm going to try to keep track of my time here. I don't see it on my tablet. Uh, okay. I'm having all kinds of issues today. <laughs> go, uh, go. The first, no worries, Andrew. I got you. Okay. All right. The first scripture I want to go to is Romans chapter five, verse 19. And let me, let me make this a little bit interactive. I just want uh, maybe a few of you out there, if you could just raise your hand and just tell me what your understanding of righteousness is. Because I want to make this a little bit interactive. If, uh, if there's no takers, that's okay. I'll just continue on. I'll give you a few minutes, a minute or so. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. All right, listen, Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Now, watch this scripture. It says, for by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Now, watch this next scripture. So by the obedience of one, many were made righteous. Many were made righteous. By the obedience of one. <clears throat> I want to paint this picture here because it's important that we understand this. A lot, I hear a lot of preaching about Adam and what Adam lost. Adam lost the kingdom and Adam lost this and Adam lost that. Adam lost everything. And what he lost is right here in verse 19. He lost righteousness. Okay. Traditional teaching teaches us that righteousness, right, is, is right standing with God. And that's true. Yeah, absolutely true. Because in 1 Corinthians, I believe when in I believe it's 130. It says that we are made the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. He made us righteous. And so when we look at Adam, we look that Adam lived in a perfect system, right? Adam lived in Eden. Adam had all provision. Adam had everything he need. He needed. He had and, and he was created in the image and the likeness of the father. Watch this, image and likeness, and I'm just going to go through this real quickly. Image and likeness, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God created man in his image and his likeness. 
It said, God created, he, he said, let us make man in our image and likeness. And he used the word us. The word us is plural. It's not singular. So when he said, let us, Elohim, make man in our image, he was saying, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we're going to make man as a, as, a, as a replica of heaven, right? So when he created Adam and Eve, when he created Adam, he created him in a three-part being because he wanted, he wanted Adam to, to resemble him, the Father in heaven. So Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and he said, uh, he created Adam as body, soul, and spirit, three-part being. Why? Because it represented the Godhead. And it's very important we understand that. That when when Adam, before he fell, he had all righteousness. And righteousness is the image and the likeness of the Father. It is the totality of everything. Because when Adam was created, he was created and he lived in a perfect system. What is the perfect system? The perfect system is the kingdom. The kingdom is flawless. The kingdom is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. We don't need to build it. We don't need to do anything to it. We don't need to enhance it. All we have to do as citizens is establish the kingdom. And how do we establish it? We establish it by the way what Adam lost, and that was righteousness. So God is restoring. His, his, his goal, it says, it says the Son of Man came uh, to seek that which was lost, right? Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek that which was lost. What was lost? Souls? We always were taught that that was an evangelistic scripture. He came to seek the lost. No, he came to seek that which was lost. What was lost? The kingdom and righteousness, he came to restore the kingdom of God and the righteousness that Adam had. Adam had a righteousness, his, and that righteousness made him perfect before the Father. He was perfect. His relationship was flawless. It could not be hindered. It could not be altered until he chose to be disobedient and partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So watch this. In this scripture, in Romans chapter 5, Verse 19, it says, for by one man's disobedience, which was Adam, many were made sinners. So now everybody after Adam had now come in what we call the fall of Adam or the Adamic nature or what, let me say it like this, the sin nature. Hello, somebody. So what Jesus came to do is he came to restore what Adam lost and reverse what Adam created by created a, he creating a bunch of disobedient people that couldn't be obedient. Now, now watch this. This is very important. We understand this. It says, so by the righteous, uh, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now let's stop right there. Okay. I've heard a lot of teaching about the law, how the law was bad and the law of this and the law was that. No, in 1 Corinthians, it says that the law was glorious, <laughs> that the administration of condemnation be glorious. How much more, right? The administration of the law of the spirit that's in Christ Jesus. So the law had a glory to it. Come on, somebody. The law contained the righteousness of God. The problem with the law is that the law couldn't make the people, therefore, perfect like itself. That was the weakness of the law. So the law contained a righteousness within it, but it couldn't, it couldn't make you righteous. It couldn't make me righteous, right? Because of sin, sin tainted that aspect uh, 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 of our relationship to God. So Jesus had to come and restore that. Watch this. It says, so by the obedience of one, by the obedience of Jesus, the perfect lamb, the sinless man, the man that had no sin. He had to walk in total obedience because that's what the law required. The law required a sacrifice. The law required somebody that can walk in complete 100% obedience and fulfill every aspect of the law. Lord Jesus, are you listening to what I'm saying? Jesus was the only one that actually fulfilled every aspect of the law, right? 
so it can accommodate and fulfill it and then the law would be would be annulled so to say because his blood was going to bring us into covenant relationship my gosh are you, are you are you following what i'm saying here it was going to bring us back into a restored life and that was going to be righteousness being restored amen so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous and because of OG, jesus's obedience to the law and being able to fulfill every aspect that the law demanded and required, he made us righteous. So we don't have to walk in that kind of obedience that the law demanded. Because why? Because now it was going to be the kingdom. It was going to be in James chapter two, right? Verses eight, I believe, I think in verse eight, it says, if you fulfill the royal law, what is the royal law now? What is the kingdom law? It's righteousness and righteousness rules by love. If you fulfill the royal law, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. So now Jesus came and fulfilled everything that the law required so that you and I wouldn't have to worry about ordinances anymore, right? So now our concentration is our relationship, which is what righteousness came to restore, our relationship back to him. So guess what? It's not a law-based relationship anymore. It's not do's and don'ts, but it's relationship, right? Now that you're, you're concentrating on your relationship to the Father, and now that that right here is established, then it goes outward to each other. I'm talking about righteousness here. Amen. We're talking about the kingdom. We're talking about these two different dynamics uh, feed off of each other because you cannot have the kingdom outside of righteousness and you cannot have righteousness outside of the kingdom. And let me say it like this. You cannot have righteousness. Righteousness doesn't work outside of a son. Oh, Lord Jesus. Righteousness only works by sonship. That's why Jesus came to restore sons. He's bringing many sons to glory, Hebrews uh, chapter 2, I believe, says, right? He's bringing us into the glory of what the law had, right, without us having to fulfill the law, but we fulfill it by our obedience in our relationship to him. Am I making sense to anybody here? Amen. Now, now I want I want us to go to uh, to Matthew chapter six, okay? One of the most quoted scriptures, and I used to quote this scripture all the time until the Lord challenged me and said, "What about what about righteousness?" Right? Matthew chapter six. What does it say? Seek first the kingdom of God, right? And it says, "And His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you." Seek first the kingdom of God. So watch this. Our relationship and our pursuit should be the understanding of the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, when Hosea says, Hosea says that my people are destroyed for what? For, for lack of knowledge, for rejecting knowledge, for not coming into. And listen to what he says. He says, so I will reject the priest who try to come to me. Because watch this, when we don't have an understanding of the kingdom and righteousness, right, we can't come to him as a priest. Because watch this, that you have the kingdom and you have righteousness. What are these two dynamics? These two dynamics are, watch this, the kingdom, right, image, and righteousness, likeness. There you have image and likeness. It's right there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a Selah moment. I'm going to take a drink of some water and let that sink in for just a moment. See, Satan was, is after your identity. He's after your identity because he knows if he can get your identity, he's got you. That's what he did to Adam. Did God say? He got Adam to question his identity and question his relationship and question himself. See, people that are insecure, have, they, they, don't, they don't have an understanding of who God is. Because when you have an understanding of who God is, it brings a security. Sonship brings security. Identity brings security where you know who you are, right? Nothing can move you. It's like David said in Psalm 62, 
The Lord is my rock and my salvation. I shall not be moved. Then he says, I shall not be greatly moved. Why? Because when your feet are on the rock, like Jesus said, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. When your feet are on the rock, when you're secure in your identity, but watch this, when you don't have the right identity and know who you are as a son in image and likeness, then you're going to build your house upon the sand. And what happened? That's that, that house fell, right? Because it wasn't built on the rock. Amen of identity and sonship and understanding. Because when you know who you are, the greatest, I believe the greatest words in the, in the scripture was when the father said, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. The most powerful words in scripture come out of heaven from the father saying to his son, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. See, there's a lot uh, today in the body of Christ that don't have an understanding of the kingdom, right? The kingdom is the system we live in. Righteousness is your identity of who you are as his son. It establishes you. It solidifies you. It, it, it secures you. It brings security. It deals with the inconsistencies. You know what righteousness does, right? Watch this. It, it brings alignment, because you have a system called the kingdom, right? Seek first the kingdom, and then the kingdom is 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 perfect. It's flawless, right? So the, and then and it says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Righteousness brings you into alignment to what the kingdom is all about. So you, we can't even represent the kingdom or manifest the kingdom if we're not living righteously. If we're, there's not a righteousness in us, and you know what righteousness is? It's transformation and change. Oh, Lord Jesus. Okay. Let me, uh, <clears throat> let me bring this understanding because this is, this, is, this is the key to the New Testament. If you understand this, you understand the kingdom and righteousness in a better, uh, 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 um, with a better understanding, all right? In Matthew 6, 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything will be added unto you. What's, what does everything mean? Well, if you read the whole chapter of chapter 6, you're going to see its provision. See, watch this. God does not want you chasing a career or riches or materialism or anything like that. He doesn't want your eyes on that. Now, am I saying that's bad? No, I'm not saying that's bad at all. But watch this. If I seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, right, then everything else would be added unto me. Riches, blessings, everything is added. But when I have my eyes on the things of this world, which is temporal, right, Colossians, what does Colossians say? Set your affection on the things that are above. What does that mean? It means this. It means when we set our affections on heavenly things, which is, which is where, what the kingdom is. The kingdom is heaven, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Where does the kingdom come? It comes from the heavenly place. It comes from the heavenly realm. So when I set my affection on things above and not on things of this world, amen, everything gets resolved. But here in, in Matthew chapter 6, and I got to go quickly because I want to take you somewhere here. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is he's giving a key to his people. And this is after the Constitution, what we call the Constitution of the Kingdom, the Beatitudes. He lays out the whole lifestyle. You know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, blessed are, uh, 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 you know, he goes in, in, into the Beatitudes. But watch, one of the Beatitudes is blessed are they that hunger and thirst after what? Huh? Just blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Righteousness is a diet that we should be eating of. You should, we should be pursuing the revelational understanding of what righteousness is. Why? Because righteousness is the restored relationship between you and your, your God, between you and the Father. Righteousness is an actual diet that you eat. That's why the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good right? Because when we begin to taste, right? When we begin to eat that diet, your spiritual journey requires a diet. This kingdom journey that we're on requires a diet 
Amen. And how many of you know that if you eat fried foods, you're not going to be healthy and you're not going to feel very good, right? But when you eat some greens, <laughs> hallelujah, amen, it makes you vibrant. It makes you a lot. Can I say it like this? There's some that are spiritually dead because they're eating the wrong diet. <laughs> Hello, somebody. There is, There are spiritual nutrients in this message of the kingdom and righteousness that if we tap into it, it brings satisfaction and fulfillment. Uh, Apostle Daniel, I can't tell you that, I'll tell you that I am satisfied in my life today than I have ever been before. Why? Because I'm walking in my purpose. I've discovered some truths. I've discovered some understandings of righteousness and the kingdom, and I'm walking in it. And as I'm walking in it, God, God has satisfied my life. Amen. He is, he's brought satisfaction. But there's, there's many that are dissatisfied. They're dissatisfied because they're, 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 not, they're not walking uh, th these truths out. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. When you discover the kingdom and righteousness and you begin to walk out these things, it helps bring your life in order with God. That's what righteousness does. It brings it in order. All right. Enough with that. We're going to go, we're going to go back a few chapters. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 3. I want to lay this foundation because I could listen to me. I could teach for hours and hours and hours on righteousness. When Apostle Cal was in the hospital, I, I taught for three months at our church ministry. Every Sunday, he said, he said, I want you to release righteousness, the understanding of it. And for three months, I was preaching righteousness, right, two, two months, righteousness, 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 because that is our life. Amen. And I'm going to show you how important this is. Matthew chapter three, watch this. You have a prophet. We call him the last Old Testament prophet by the name of John the Baptist. Amen. He comes in verse one. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Isn't it interesting that the first words that we get, we call them the 400 silent years. There wasn't a voice or a prophet that spoke in the land until John the Baptist. For 400 years, there was not the voice of God in the earth. There wasn't a prophet that rose up and spoke his voice. Here John the Baptist is after 400 years. That's how significant it is because there was going to be a shift and a change in mankind. He says, repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. It's now. It's going to manifest. Now watch this, okay? Verse 3. For this is he that was spoken of the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, what? Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. You know what John the Baptist was preaching? righteousness because he was saying the kingdom is here but now something is going to be released in the earth that's going to help you straighten out your path <laughs> it's a bad translation because what 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 john the baptist was saying is that righteousness is about ready to be released back into the earth and when it does it's going to help you straighten out your life because you couldn't do it before but now Amen. That you get born again and the blood cleanses you and the blood of Jesus brings you into covenant relationship to God. Now there's going to be a righteousness that's going to help you. It's going to help you straighten your marriage out. It's going to help you straighten your relationships out. It's going to help straighten you in your thinking, your relationship, whatever it is, righteousness is there that's going to come and now help you. And can I say it like this? Righteousness really is a person. His name is Jesus. <laughs> oh Lord. His name is Jesus. He's calling about. I know you guys are being taught about the corporate man. Who is the corporate man? It's Jesus. Because you have the individual man and then you have the corporate man. The individual man is his righteousness working, amen, to make in a habitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 2. 
It's the apostle and prophet laying the foundation. You have a prophet here in John the Baptist laying a foundation of righteousness, paving the way for uh, the apostle who's Jesus that's going to come on the scene. He's setting a precedence here because something significant is going to happen in the world with John the Baptist releasing this word of repentance, right? Change your thinking, change your understanding. Uh, you, need to, you, need to, you need to cut yourself from the ties of the Judaistic system of religion and the law that could do absolutely nothing for you. The law or religion, can I say it like that? Religion can't do anything for you. I'm here to tell you that 43,000 denominations are in the world today. Not one of them can do a single darn thing for you, except for bring frustration and doubt and envy and jealousy and all that stuff is of the religious system. It was in the Judaistic system. They were fighting over position. They were arguing about the law. Who's right? Who's wrong? But I'm telling you what, when you have a kingdom understanding, it's not about who's right or who's wrong. It's about religion relationship. It's about righteousness. It's about what God has done for you to bring you back into right relationship of what Adam lost from the very beginning. What Adam lost, he lost the kingdom. He lost righteousness. He lost dominion. He lost sonship. He lost image and likeness. He lost it all in one decision. And so here in Matthew chapter three, I got to go quickly here. I don't know how much time do I have, Apostle Daniel. Go, go to work. Go okay. ahead. In Matthew chapter three, we see a prophet here comes on the scene and he begins to release a message of the kingdom in verse two and repentance, repentance and the kingdom. I wish many in the body of Christ would get this understanding. Because many today in the, in the church need to repent from a lack of a kingdom understanding and revelation and to come into understanding and being taught what the kingdom really is all about. The only message Jesus ever taught was the kingdom. That's it. He didn't teach about himself. He didn't teach about healing, <laughs> Apostle Daniel. He didn't teach about any of that stuff. He taught the kingdom, and out of the kingdom came everything, all provision, all healing, right? And how it is worked out is through a process called righteousness. Righteousness, in fact, a great scripture is Isaiah 32, 17 and 18. That's one of my favorite scriptures. It says, the work of righteousness is peace. The effect of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. Did you know that righteousness is a work of God in your life? It's working in you to bring transformation and change. That's why John the Baptist says in verse 3, prepare ye the way of the Lord. What did he mean by that? He meant that righteousness is coming to work in your heart and in your life. That's why in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you know that the renewing, the renewal process of your mind is righteousness working in your life, in your heart? Righteousness is the renewing process. Well, watch this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, we quote it all the time, right? And we many of us may have taught this. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, right? Dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You know what righteousness does? It's circumcision of the heart. That's what Paul's talked about in Romans chapter 12, uh, 2. Paul talked about the circumcision of the heart. But he also, uh, and I'll get the scripture for you, but I believe it's in Romans chapter 5. It, it says the seal of circumcision is righteousness. Because righteousness was given to bring a circumcision or cutting away, right, of the flesh, the fleshly part of the heart. Amen. It gets down to the, to the thoughts and the intents of your heart. 
So you know what? God gave us his righteousness in the earth to help deal with our intention. What is your intention? Is it God's intention? Is it a kingdom mindset? Is it a kingdom understanding? Is your intention for the kingdom or is your intention for yourself? This is what John the Baptist was talking about in, in verse three, prepare ye the way of the Lord. In other words, John the Baptist was saying, listen, righteousness is coming to bring alignment back because this thing is so messed up in Judaism. And I'm telling you, you know, the Pharisees were like an offshoot of, of the Judaistic system. They weren't even a legal system. They were man-made, like, like denomination <laughs> off of Christianity is man-made. It didn't come from the heart of God. The Judaistic system did come from God. It was given from, Moses, from God to Moses, and Moses implemented that system. And the Pharisees were an offshoot. They were, they were a denomination. And here John the Baptist is saying, I'm going to straighten everything out. But you're going to have to learn. You're going to have to understand that it's going to come by the way of righteousness. Now, I got to move quickly. Amen. We're going to jump down to verse 13. And, and here's, here's the key. And I may, I may uh, close here with this, uh, Apostle Daniel. <clears throat> verse 13. We're in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Then came Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, uh, I need to be baptized of you, and you're coming to me. Now, verse 15 is so powerful. It's so powerful because this is the New Testament. This is the new covenant right here. It's right here. Remember, we just read in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, what did it say? Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, right? That's the priority, the priority of my life. Please hear what I'm going to say, <laughs> y'all. Please hear what I'm going to say. It's not my wife. It's not my children. The priority of my life is the kingdom in the pursuit of his righteousness. Because if I have righteousness in my life, I know how to treat my children and I know how to treat my wife. I could treat my wife with justice because we get the word justice from righteousness. It, 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 it translates, right? And, I, and I, 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 maybe I'll come back and go deeper because there's two words for the word righteousness in the New Testament. Uh, dikaiosune, right? And that word means equity and uh, uh, dikaios, which means equitable. And watch this. It means in character, so watch this. <laughs> Our character is what God is after. Yeah. If I can't treat my wife right, what business do I have trying to represent him? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. It's because there's a lack of understanding of righteousness. See, what? oh man, I wish I could get into this more. Let me move on. <laughs> All right. Verse 15. And Jesus answered and said unto him, to John the Baptist, suffer it to, and I'm reading out of the King James, so you might have a different translation, that's all right. It says, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all, everybody say all, all righteousness. You know what Jesus came to do? He came to bring back righteousness. That was the priority of the Father because the Father knew that you and I would not be able to serve him outside of his righteousness in Christ. Then he gave the Holy Ghost. <laughs> he gave us the power and the ability to do it. And when righteousness and the Holy Ghost kiss together, my God, your life is going to transform forevermore. You think, you know, uh, we were witnessing my wife and I several years ago, and we were in San Francisco, and there was a young man there, and, and, uh, and we were just sharing. It was, it, was, it was at night, and I just saw him by himself, and, uh, and I just, the Lord led me over to him, and I just began to minister to him, and he says, you know what? Christianity never worked for me. God didn't work for me, and I thought to myself, Lord, the, this man had an experience with the religious system. 
Do you understand how important it is for you and I to get this thing right? I'm not trying to serve God out of a religious experience. Listen, I'm not, I'm here, I'm seeking the kingdom and I'm seeking his righteousness because watch what Jesus says. He says, thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Oh my God, my God, my God. The first thing that Jesus does in his earthly ministry before he did anything ministerially was to reestablish the Father's righteousness back into the earth. Because that was the place that Jesus ministered from. Then, after he's baptized, the Holy Ghost falls on him and animates the gift of God through him in the ministry that he has. Can I say it like this? God is not interested in any of your gifts. Though he gave you gifts, he's not interested in your gifts. Jesus had not done one miracle, not one miracle did Jesus do. And what did the father say? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. (coughs) The father is interested in your relationship to him as a priority before anything else you do for him. Apostle Daniel, I don't know where my time is up, but I think that might be a spot. Two minutes, two minutes. Two minutes, minutes. all right. Unless you Uh, I. It's up to you. Maybe questions. Do we, do we want to open it up yeah. for questions or yeah. maybe comments or some yeah. you didn't understand? <clears throat> yes, we'll do that. We'll do that. Andrew, listen, what a wonderful word. Uh, a lot said, man of God. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for the man of God. My goodness. This is life changing stuff. We're not playing here. We're not playing. This is not a fire drill. We're really doing this. Uh, I thank the Lord, Andrew, for you. Uh, you are anointed and a carrier of that message, the message of righteousness. I've heard it many times now, and you've come from a lot of different angles with that thing. Uh, and so I thank you. You know what, Apostle Daniel, which, you know, and let me I'll say this before we open it up. When I was when I was really pursuing the kingdom and digging into the revelation that I saw the kingdom everywhere in the Old Testament, the stories, everything I've seen it. But when I begin to press into righteousness, I now begin to see righteousness in everything. I mean, it, it's blown my mind. I see it in the Old Testament. I see it in the New. And that's why I can preach it in all kinds of different angles. Yes. Because I'm digging into this thing. I understand the importance of, of, of the righteousness of God and how it's working in us. Mm. You know, it's it's the righteousness of God that wills to do of his good pleasure. (laughs) That's what it is. That's what's working in us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. Then, Andrew, just very powerful. You know, quite simply said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what I've understood as this man has been preaching is that, of course, it is not our own righteousness. That's right. Come on. Yeah, but, but it is he that has made us righteous. So he's looking for what he has made in us. That's, that's how. And so when we flow, we flow based on what he did and not what we did. And so I think that that would help us right there in addition to all that has been said today that it, it, it's the expression of him through me and my ministry. It has absolutely nothing to do with me. I have been made the righteousness of God. Andrew, that blessed me. Listen, uh, the floor is open. Listen to the rules. Here's the rules. This is nobody's time to preach. We're giving you two minutes, two minutes to share your heart, to ask a question, to share your viewpoint on something. And when the two minutes is up, you stop We'll let somebody else go if they're quiet and you still have more questions or statements you want to make, you can come back again. So look at yourself in the screen and say two minutes 
And what I'm going to do right now, and well, and I'll, I'll, I'll let the recording continue for a few more minutes. All right, floor is open. Does anybody have, Prophet Cynthia, go ahead, girl. Prophet Andrew, thank you so much. It's great to see you as always. Um, I really, really enjoyed your message, especially you said everything that was fantastic. But some of the things I wrote down was when you said righteousness is a diet that we should be eating. And it never dawned on me the way that it's stated. And it's telling me that righteousness is something that I could partake of on purpose. And I also, when you were speaking, I heard the, the Lord tell me that righteousness is a force. So the force of righteousness in my own life will cause me to come into places that I don't have clarity in. Because things are closed up become open to me. I, I, I like it when you stated also that uh, righteousness brings satisfaction to you. It does because you're seeking what he wants. When you're seeking what God wants, he satisfies you with all good things. The scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 says for us to awake to righteousness and sin not. So that means that we're falling asleep, that we are in a stupor. So he says, hey, you got to wake up come out of this stupor so you could see the things in which God is calling for you to come into. And so I just thank you so much for tonight's word. God bless you. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Who else has something? Uh, there it is. Apostle Richard Wright. Uh, first, let me apologize. I've had nothing but one, one problem after another trying to get on. So, uh, Andrew, this we know how the devil works. He doesn't want us to hear it. He throws in uh, interruptions. And uh, so I finally got back where I could get on. It's not the best, but I'm not. So I, I just want to tell you, that's a, it's a excellent message. It's uh, so needed in the body of Christ. But I, the experience I've had is I find that most Christians think they already understand it they already understand what righteousness is and they think they're righteous because he's righteous and and so they don't pay any attention to it but i found a scripture in psalms that says righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne so i teach that now in in foundation classes they young people new christians need to be taught righteousness and justice in fact, we've got a throne on our platform in the church, and our carpenter fellow made a nice carved wooden sign that says righteousness and justice and put that under the throne. And it's just it's very powerful when we recognize that this is basic stuff that if we don't get the basic stuff right, we're going to have problems in the others. But appreciated the message. Thank you, Andrew. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Apostle. Good to see you, Apostle Wright. Mm. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Keep, keep looking hard. I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> Anybody else has a question or a statement that they would like to make? Come on, yo. We're stirring up. This is kingdom talk. Let's talk kingdom. Amen. Ray, just lift your hands. Okay. Uh, Elder Lynn Brown, God bless you. Go ahead. Amen. Um, so much of what you said, I guess, really should wake us up because you mentioned about insecurity, allowing the enemy to steal our identity. And if we do not believe that Christ has provided this righteousness for us, then we don't do anything about it. We just think this is something that you just, that just is a wand that's, that's kind of been passed over us and we don't have any part in it. But it's God's influence. It's his grace over us, his constant influence in our lives by his word, by his Holy Spirit. And we have to be partakers of the things that he's provided, the provision he's made by his word and by his Holy Spirit. Even in fellowship with the body of Christ, he's got a pattern for all of it that we might uh, receive the fullness of that righteousness through exchange between the many membered body exchange between the Lord and ourselves fellowship with him. All of it is a process that he brings us through. 
in order to bring forth his righteousness, the transformation that you were speaking about in us. And so that's um, what I was hearing you say. Amen. God bless you, Elder Lynn. Appreciate that. Wonderful. Uh, Cornelius. Yes, good evening, Apostle Prophet Andrew. The thing that uh, got to me was when you first came on, you asked the question, what is, you proposed the question, what is righteousness? And then you went on into your teaching and you see that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added on to you. So the answer was, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's his righteousness. Mm -hmm. And that was the answer to the question that you had proposed to us when you had asked us what was righteousness. Mm -hmm. And that's my, that's my take on that, sir. Beautiful, beautiful teaching, sir. All right. All right. Thank you, Cornelius. Come on, y'all don't y'all don't pile up too fast now. Amen. Who's next? Who's got a question or a statement? All right, Rupert, God bless you. Hey, God bless you, sir. It's great to be here. I got on a little late, but uh nonetheless, uh that's a powerful scripture, uh, Matthew 6 33, I tell you, and it, it's really about the priority and process. See. Everybody, no, not everyone. I'm not going to make that that statement. Everybody, most, some people uh, want the the microwave, want it real quick, two, you know, thirty seconds, and, and it's done. But it, with God, is a crock pot. We got to develop a crock pot anointing and understand that everything with God is is order and a process, and there should always be progress, which is growth in the process. Thank you, sir. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rupert. God bless Can I say you. something to that real quick? <clears throat> you know, righteousness is the process. <laughs> it is the process of transformation. And, you know, <clears throat> Apostle Daniel, um, I, I hear a lot of different kingdom preachers. Now, no, please don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm a kingdom guy. I, I love preaching the kingdom. I'll release it and sing the kingdom all day long. But I, I, the Lord challenged me with a question. He says, I want you to examine a lot of these kingdom preachers and look at their life it's out of order it's a mess it's jacked up and yes. he said because righteousness is not working mm. they haven't they haven't come to the revelational understanding of righteousness because it brings alignment there's no lack in the kingdom <clears throat> there's no disappointment in the kingdom there's no frustration in the kingdom. And so righteousness helps us. That's why John the Baptist says, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make it straight. The steps of a what man are right. ordered by you? Right. <clears throat> Watch this. The prayers, the effectual prayers of a who? Availeth much? So <clears throat> if our prayers are not availing much, maybe it's because we're praying outside of righteousness. Maybe it's because we don't even have an understanding of righteousness and our prayers are not being effective. We're praying outside the will of the Father because <clears throat> the prayer that he taught the disciples was our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. How is his will done? When we make straight the way of the Lord. That's the will of the Father is established through the process of, of righteousness. <clears throat> it is so important because it aligns, it adjusts, it makes adjustments in us. Ooh, I need to adjust that thing in my life. And it helps you. And then with the power of the Holy Ghost, you're able to, you're able to do something about that. You can't do it on your own, <clears throat> but until you seek and pursue. In fact, that word seek in Matthew chapter six, watch this. It means to pursue it means to be driven. It means to seek something that's hidden, secrets, mysteries. But watch this, Apostle Daniel. It also means worship. Yeah. Hmm. It means worship. Because true worship comes, right, from the place of the kingdom and his righteousness in spirit and in truth. Hmm. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lord. Bless you, many God. That's awesome. That's an awesome word, Andrew. And we see now, Eric. Thank you, Dad, for the opportunity to share and to speak. Um, Prophet Andrew, that was very powerful, uh, what you shared tonight. Thank you for that. And what I heard you sharing tonight was you made a statement. You said the kingdom is image and righteousness is the likeness. And you brought that out because that's, you said, that's what man lost. And it, and you went on to say how religion was the cheap substitute that we used to fill in that void of righteousness. And when you think about how, you know, all the, the arguments of religion is trying to prove themselves to be right in some matter. But when you think about it, Jesus came and introduced the real standard of righteousness. And I love how he bypasses all of the dogmas and the doctrinal debates and goes straight to the character of a man. And that's the righteousness that the father is really after. So that blessed my life tremendously tonight. It made me repent in some thoughts that I had about righteousness. And I really, really appreciate it. It blessed me tremendously. Thank you. Amen. Amen. If I can add something to that, Eric, because it's so important the after after Jesus is baptized and, and the father says that it says the heavens were open. Right. So it, it, righteousness opens the heavens. Can I say it like that? And the heavens are open now to a son. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now watch this right after that. He goes into the he fast for 40 days and he goes into the wilderness. What was it? Jesus didn't need to be tempted. Right. He was perfect. Why did he need to be tempted? He went in there to defeat an enemy <clears throat> by the name of Satan. He went in there to defeat an enemy. And how did he defeat him? Watch this. Satan says, if you are the son of God, twice, if you are the son of God. Then he, then he tries to take two things away from him like he did Adam. He said, if you bow down, give up your priesthood, and worship me, then I'll give you the kingdoms and make you a king. So here's what Satan's after. He's after the priest and the king. And I know you guys are getting some good teaching on the Melchizedek order of priesthood, but Satan is after your priest and your king. Image and likeness. He tried to strip it again from the son of God, but he lost that battle. Right? That's why you and I are here today. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Eric, God bless. Uh, some great comments. Uh, I see one of the Baxters has something. Yes, I do. Prophet Andrew, thank you for that awesome message tonight and clarity on righteousness. Knowing that it's not my righteousness, you know, like I've been hearing, you know, for years, talk about, you know, your, your righteousness. And when you said that, uh, righteousness is transformation and change that really said something to me you know it's like it, it really helps me to become in the image and likeness of God with the transformation and the change so therefore I don't retain my own righteousness anymore it's the righteousness that of you know of his not mine own and also when you said the father is interested in my relationship with him before I do anything. And that have a lot to do with him building and making my character to be like him after his likeness and his righteousness and his image. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eddie. God bless you. Thank you for that comment. <clears throat> so we have Apostle Richard Wright. There he is again. Come on. Well, uh, just one thing real quick. When I grow up, I want to preach like Andrew. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Blessings. Blessings. Anyone else? I know Andrew's going to. How, how can you preach like me when I want to preach like Apostle Richard Wright? Come on. <laughs> we, we, we should discuss that. <laughs> Man. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll get on the throne and discuss that. All right. Amen. Uh, we have T. T, go ahead. Hello, how's everybody doing? Lovely evening. Um, Prophet Andrew, this is my first time ever hearing you, hearing you speak. And I just would like to say that um, 
you really helped me out to look for something. I'm not sure if anyone spoke on it. If you have, I apologize about that. But um, something that I really stuck out to me today was um, I had to learn that since we're speaking about righteousness, I had to learn that pride and righteousness cannot live in the same presence. Mm -hmm. So I I really had a, a issue today where um, I work in a nursing home and we have a minister. He comes in and he noticed that something wasn't right with me today. And he asked me, he said, I always see you got a smile on your face, you know, your energy, you interact with the residents and stuff like that. And he said, well, can I ask you a question? And I said, yes, go ahead. And he said, um, what's your, what's your purpose? And he said, whether it's, you know, with a career, this job, whatever. And I said, to serve. He said, that's all I wanted to know. So I just wanted to say that. And thank you for letting me be able to be a part of this. I really appreciate that. Amen. Thank you, T, for that. Anybody else? Question? Statement, question or statement, question or statement. You know, while you were talking, Andrew, Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. And, and it's righteousness that keeps us from walking in that. And as we said earlier, if I'm going to minister, I'm ministering through the righteousness that he has created in me, given to me, made me righteous so that when I am ministering, I'm ministering through his power and not my own. So therefore, there's no condemnation in my mind, nothing that could accuse me, telling me that I can't or attacking me because it's really not about me at all. It's about what he has done, and I agree with that, and therefore the enemy should not be. And that's what that wilderness temptation thing was all about. It was about identity as well. I didn't, do you know who you are? That's what that's all about. Do I know who I am? And so we should, and when we do, then our ministry is affected because of a knowledge of who we were created to be in him righteous. Amen. Sean Sabine, I see your hand up, man. God, go ahead. Prophet. Yes, sir. When you started, when you started talking, I heard this verse, Ephesians, and it kind of brought things home for me why this lesson is so relevant to now. Ephesians 4, 24, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, and true holiness. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you know this is this is the environment of of our internality. This is the environment of the system of thought or the way of thinking that encompasses intentions and motives in within the context of God's holy character. So it's almost like you know the righteousness, you know, faith when expressed in my spirit manifests as righteous thoughts. The thoughts of the righteous are right. Faith, when it is expressed in my soul, is uh, every way of man is right in his own eyes, is justification. And faith is expressed in my body as sanctification. So that was so beautiful. So I'm, I'm, I'm coming from the inside out. So I thank y'all for having me tonight to just learn and be filled up because it's good to hear the word of God today. I've got a scripture for you, Andrew. Ephesians chapter 5. And it starts with eight. It says, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Then it says, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. So righteousness is that thing that helps us to prove or even approve what is right in and before God. Without that, we could not approve. I just heard it's it's got it's the equity of the kingdom. Woo. Come on here, somebody. <laughs> you gotta leave me alone, Apostle Friends. I'm trying to go to sleep, go to bed, mess with me. I'm just trying to quote some scriptures, and there you go jumping all over me, man. Amen. And, and this is powerful. Uh, again, in all goodness 
and righteousness, goodness, righteousness, and truth are working together. They're working together to be able to prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. Righteousness is the fruit of the spirit. It calls it the fruit of the spirit is in all. And so uh, I thank you for that, Andrew. This is a so much, there's so much in this, man. There's so much in righteousness. Yes. yes. There's, there's a lot, man. There's so much here. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Come on. Anybody else? The statement? Elder Lynn, go ahead. Um, Prophet Andrew, you mentioned about the circumcision of the heart. And uh, in Romans, of course, it's speaking about circumcision, uncircumcision, that none of it matters, that it's the circumcision of the heart. Mm -hmm. And in the, the Passion Translation, it says in, in Romans 2.29, it says, but you are Jewish because of the uh, inward act of spiritual circumcision, a radical change that lays bare your heart. It's not by the principle of the written code, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. For then your praise will come from not from people, but from God himself. And that is the, uh, the validation that even came from the father before Christ did anything, because his heart was right with his father, uh, even before he did a single miracle or did a single thing. When he began his ministry, the Lord, the father recognized that his son's heart was with him and to be obedient to him and all that he did. And so that's what God's looking for in us as well, um, that righteousness that comes through a, a full obedience unto him, trusting in him and walking in what he's called us to do. Amen. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Thank you, Rupert. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to chime in. Uh, I know as you were you were talking, Apostle, the scripture that fell in my, fell in my spirit was actually a out of the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So God is actually pleading that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, meaning is the least you can do. It's the bare minimum, your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So in other words, we can't operate in righteousness if we're operating in the world, doing the things of the world, trying to fit in the peer pressure and the, you know, just going along with the, the status quo, right? And uh, the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Hey, you know, Andrew, what's powerful is you said that Adam lost everything. So then it behooves us to say that Jesus restored everything. Yes, sir. It is critical for us to be able to understand what was the original intent what was in the mind of before the man fell. Because really, our doctrine always been uh, from the standpoint of unrighteousness and we always center in and focus on how great the fall of man was, but we never spent time uh, seeing what was in God's mind and what was Adam like to understand what he lost uh, before the fall. And so it is critical that we come to an understanding of a study of that. What was, and he says that we should be holy uh, in love without blame is what it says in Ephesians 4, uh, 1 and 4. That was the original intent of God. And that all equals to what? He made us righteous. He made Adam righteous in the beginning. Isn't that something? So by his disobedience, he lost all of it. But thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have everything. I mean, everything. Everything. <clears throat> everything. And you know what's powerful, uh, Apostle Daniel, when you have the understanding of righteousness, you have the understanding that you have everything you need is in you already. If yes. the kingdom is in you, there you don't lack a single thing. See, religion and denomination teaches you you need to get something from God. Yes. Listen to me. I don't need to get anything from God. He gave me everything I need. 
Mm-hmm. If I need healing, it's in me. Yes. If I need deliverance, it's in me. If I need finances, it's in me. I pull it from the kingdom. I threw righteousness. Yeah. And watch. The reason why God did that is because he wants you to be focused on him only. Not trying to get something from him because he already gave you everything. Oh. Through the purpose of righteousness. Oh, he wants God. your heart. <laughs> That's what he wants you to focus on. Yeah. Not the things of this world or what you need to get from him because you don't need to get anything from him. You already have it. It's in you. Hey, did y'all hear that, ladies and gentlemen? So that we, he doesn't want us struggling and striving for anything because he doesn't want anything competing with his, the attention we should be giving to him. Jesus, come on, man. So, 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 so it's all in us. And that's why we have to come to that place to where we, we strive to understand how to tap into his presence. And Andrew, you made a statement uh, concerning the fact that, uh, that righteousness is concentrating on relationship with the father. Yes, it is. Yes. And so what that really means is the desire of God above all things is that uh, what was restored is fellowship with him. He desires that above all things is to fellowship with his sons again. So I thank the Lord for the work of Jesus. Yeah, Andrew, wow, powerful stuff. Richard Sharp, Pastor Sharp, what you got, man of God? Paul, so uh, Prophet Andrew, I've been to listen to this the third time because <laughs> I just had an opportunity recently to hear you the first time. Yeah. And so now I can compare notes and it's powerful. And, you know, when it really boils all down is all we have to do is serve the master That's and true. allow him to feed us because he's done everything for us and we don't need to be doing anything but says serve him. But we, we make it difficult for ourselves. And we think we want to do this and that. So thank you, Andrew, Prophet Andrew. Powerful, good to see you, powerful. Pastor Sharp. Yeah. You're looking good. Good to see you. All right. Good Andrew. seeing you, sir. I know you're about to go into another meeting, Andrew. You're yeah. Gonna, you have two minutes. Go ahead. And what, what, what last thoughts would you like to give to this group uh, before you leave? Yeah. You know, uh, my last thoughts is that, and I'm going to say this uh, open-ended. You're going to have to really seek this out. But it's in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. But in verse 4, we, it, says, it talks about the seven eyes of the Spirit. But in verse 4, it says that Jesus judged the poor through righteousness. So watch this. We've always been taught that judgment is a bad thing, and it's not. Judgment is the greatest thing that God could have ever given us because righteousness is a judgment, and it doesn't judge to destroy you. It judges in your favor. Mm. That's why Jesus, he, he used righteousness to judge blind Bartimaeus. He used righteousness, and he judged his condition to bring healing. Are you listening to what I'm saying? When we tap into that kind of understanding that God has, he's given us his righteousness, not to destroy people, but to judge their condition, to set them free. That's a whole nother aspect, a whole nother understanding of righteousness that we need to learn how to live from that place, that the righteousness of God in me can help judge the condition and you and anybody out there who I may encounter. Amen. Amen. And finally, I want to say this in your presence, Andrew, uh, concerning fathers. Genesis 18, 19 is a, is a righteousness scripture in the Hebrew where he's saying, uh, for I know him that he will teach his children and his household after him to do justice and judgment and to keep the way of the Lord so that the promises that God made to Abraham will come to pass. His children got to bring justice in judgment, and the Father teaches them to keep the way of the Lord. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you for having me. God bless everyone. It's great to see you, uh, Ezra. Good to see you and your wife and everybody else that I've that I've seen in the past. God bless you.